Good morning, Journey. Woo. Wasn't worship awesome today? Give God a hand. Come on. You know, I could have sworn doing worship, but I saw a glimpse into heaven, and I saw Jesus high on his throne, and he was talking to John. And Jesus said, John, John, wait, wait, wait. I think I hear Journey Church worshiping me, and it's really good. Hold on, John. Your praise reaches the throne room. Isn't that powerful? I don't know about you, but I love worship. It's the best time of the week for me, right? I can just worship and all the cares are gone. It's peace, right? Is it just me? Am I the only one that feels that way? Praise God. Amen. And when it's over, I don't want it to end, right? And I want more of the Lord, right? That's called revival. That would be a revival, right? And lucky for you, that's what we're talking about today, revival, historical church revival. And make no mistake, any church that dedicates a Sunday to talk about revival wants to see revival. And this church is no different, friend. We are praying for revival. Amen? The denomination that I used to attend, and I still love, the Assemblies of God, we used to schedule revivals, right? Six months in advance. We'd have a Sunday, right, sister, right? We'd have a Sunday through Wednesday night service. Woo, woo, right? And the Sunday night crowd would be the typical same Sunday night crowd, right? And then Monday night, we'd have 10 or 15 people because only the super spiritual people go to church on Monday night, right? That's not the revival we're talking about, friend. That is not what we're talking about. You can't schedule a move of God. You and I can't schedule a move of God. That's not what we want. I don't want a man-made revival. That's not what we're praying for. We're praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like we saw at Azusa Street in Brownsville, which we're going to talk about today. Amen? That's what we are talking about. So that's the definition of revival today. It's an outpouring of God's Spirit. And because we're using the word revival, we're not trying to revive something that's dead. This church is not dead. Are you dead as a church? No. The Holy Spirit has been moving in our midst, Right? And because we're praying for revival, that doesn't negate all that the Lord has done in our, what, 15 or 16 years. God has done some amazing things at Journey. From the first week, when way more people showed up than we expected, right? We've always been a large church. God has always been moving here. In fact, the first small group that Sandy and I went to was a marriage small group. And we thought it would be nice, right? It's done by the couple in our neighborhood. Go meet a couple couples, a few couples from the church in our neighborhood. It would be fantastic, right? So we get there, and there's like over 40 people in this small group, right? There are some churches in Jacksonville that don't have 40 people, Journey, right? We've seen healings right here at this altar. I myself have received a healing right here at this altar. We have seen thousands of people come to Christ Week after week, they raise their hand in here to say yes to Jesus. God has used this church. We have seen baptism in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit in operation. So God has done mighty things, right? So we're talking about revival, but we need more. The kingdom of God is always advancing, right? The army of the Lord is always going forward. So we're not negating all that he's done, but we say yes to you, Lord. We want more. Are you with me, Journey? All right. So here's what we're going to talk about today. For just a few minutes, we're going to look at three historical revivals. The day of Pentecost, the Azusa Street Revival, which was one of my favorite revivals, and the Brownsville Revival, right? Look at those three revivals. And we're going to talk about three common denominators that were common in all three revivals. And we see them common in most revivals. The first is prayer. Every single revival in church history started because people started to pray. They sought the Lord. They prayed for revival. Every single revival starts right there. The second common denominator is a sudden event. So after that season of prayer, there's a sudden event that happens. And the third is a continual outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Those three common denominators. So that's what we're talking about today. Are you still with me? Okay. And the results of these revivals are as you would expect. An amazing increase in salvations, healings, signs and wonders, baptism in the Holy Spirit, and they spread like wildfire. A real revival will spread like wildfire, 
right? From city to city, from church to church, state to state, nation to nation. It's not housed here, right? That's a real revival. It spreads like wildfire. So let's look at the first one, the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Pick up the story. Remember, Jesus told the disciples to go and tarry until I send the comforter. That's all he told them. <laughs> go and tarry until I send you the comforter. We pick up the story in verse uh, 14, chapter 1. And these, who are these? Well, that's the disciples, right? And about 110 of their best friends, right? There were 120 that were in the upper room praying. These all with one accord. Can you get 120 of the people to agree on anything? <laughs> with one accord. Unity is important as we seek revival, church. They were all with one accord, and they continued steadfastly in prayer. There's the first common denominator, in prayer. But it says they weren't just praying. No, no, no. They were steadfastly in prayer, which means constantly or with conviction. So they prayed with conviction and constantly for prayer. Let's see the result of that prayer. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was now come... They were all, still all together. <laughs> Amazing. In one place and suddenly, there's our second common denominator, right? Suddenly. There's a suddenly event that occurred. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound as of the rushing of a mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now when I read scripture, I like to put myself there. So let's not just read this and think that sounds nice, right? Put yourself in their place. You're in the upper room with 119 friends, and this is what's happening. Experience this. Are you with me? J.D., you with me, bro? All right. And there appeared unto them tongues of parting asunder, like as a fire. And it sat upon each one of them. And they were all, say all, filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You can imagine what this scene caused in Jerusalem that day, can't you? Because we read later on that the crowd was like amazed. They wondered. And some of them mocked, right? Thought they were drunk. Let's pick up the story. Then Peter. Now, <laughs> this is the same Peter, mind you, who fell asleep when he was supposed to be praying, right? Who denied Jesus three times, right? And who was so slow, he couldn't even beat John to the empty tomb, right? So I guess John is the disciple that Jesus loved because Peter couldn't even beat him to the tomb. That's the same Peter we're talking about right here. But notice now, this Peter filled with what? The Holy Spirit transformed, and Peter stands up and preaches the best sermon he has ever preached, based on the results. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and spake forth unto them, saying, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and give ear unto my words. And he goes on to preach his sermon. Part of his sermon, he quotes the prophet Joel, Joel 2.28. And Joel said, and this is Peter quoting Joel, and it shall be in the last days, saith God, I will pour forth my spirit unto all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. I say, come on, Lord. Amen? But Peter's telling them, that's what you just saw. What just occurred is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And he continues on. For the sake of time, we'll skip down to the results of Peter's amazing ser uh, sermon. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they had heard this, when the people in Jerusalem, the crowd heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent. 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 And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, 
For to you is the promise, and to your children, and to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. That would seem to negate the cessationist theology, no? But that's a topic for another day. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. They then that received his word were baptized, and they were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. That is a revival, my friends, right? This church grew from 120 to 3,000 in day one. And they added daily and daily. That is a revival. That's not a scheduled revival, right? Starting on February 2nd. No, 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 no. That is an outpouring of the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen? And what was common? Let's look at the three characteristics that we saw in that story, right? The first one was prayer. But let me show you something. So Peter quoted Joel chapter 2, verse 28, right? Verse 28. But let me show you what he says in chapter 2, verse 12. So before we see the outpouring, we see this. This is Joel 2. Yet even now says Jehovah, Turn ye unto me with all your heart and with fasting. And we are fasting as a church, praise God. And with weeping and with mourning. So before the outpouring, there's the prayer and the fasting and the weeping and the mourning for the lost. You, you catch that? You see that, right? So before we see the outpouring, we've got to pay a price, right? We have to weep and mourn and fast for the lost. That's what's happening right there. The followers of Jesus, 120, gathered in one place. Now, here's what's amazing to me. He told them to go and tarry, right? They didn't know what they were waiting for other than they were going to get the comforter. And he didn't tell them how long to wait, right? So they didn't know how long they were going to be there, and they didn't know what they were waiting for exactly. But when they showed up, they knew exactly what it was. Praise God. They knew exactly what it was. And they were steadfast in prayer. They didn't tarry. They were steadfast in prayer, seeking the Lord. Amen? Second common characteristic is a sudden event. We saw a sudden event there, right? The scripture said, suddenly, Holy Spirit filled the room. They spoke with tongues. He baptized everyone. Notice something. The Holy Spirit is free and sovereign. He is free and sovereign. He doesn't care about your timing or your technique. Right? He will pour out his spirit the way he will pour out his spirit. You can't tell him how to do it. I'm guessing the apostles wouldn't have done it that way. Right? Tongues of fire over their heads, they might not have done it that way. Right? You can't tell the Holy Spirit how to pour out his spirit. He is free and sovereign. And if you want revival, he will do it his way and in his timing. Amen? Third characteristic was a continual outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the entire book of Acts shows the continual outpouring of the Holy Spirit that began on the day of Pentecost. And it continues to this day. It has not stopped. Amen? Y'all still with me? Okay. Don't get all Presbyterian on me. We're talking about revival. I mean, don't get Presbyterian on me now. All right. Second revival is Azusa Street. And I love Azusa Street, my favorite revival of all time. And we see the same three characteristics at Azusa Street. We're going to talk about it in a second. Now, some of you may remember a few years ago, Pastor Eric and Mary Jo went to Los Angeles, and they went to the site of Azusa Street, and they sent us back a video. Do we still have that video, maybe? I'm here with Mary Jo. We're at the famous Azusa Street. You can see the sign up there, the Azusa Street Mission. This is a famous location where the Pentecostal revival began here in um, Los Angeles. Sadly, today there's not much to even let you know that it took place. There's the marker that's up there that talks about it just a little bit. But man, would you join me in praying for revival for our nation? Again, we need this kind of a revival to take place again. We need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So as we stand here in Los Angeles, I think about our own city. We we want to just stand here and pray that God would move in a powerful way in Jacksonville, that we would see many people come to know Jesus, that we could experience the same kind of revival that they did that day in 1906 when William Seymour first preached here. Um, man, I just long to see something like that happen in our own generation. Would you join me in praying that for Jacksonville as well? Just look at that sign one more time, guys. Let me see 
if I can find it. I'm terrible at these selfie kind of things. You'll have to excuse me. Oh, there's the LAPD sign. Let me step up a little bit further. There it is. Thank you for joining us at the Azusa Street location. Lord, just believe. We're believing God right here where that revival took place, that it could happen once again in our own generation. Lord, just do it. Move powerfully in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. God bless you to all our friends back home. Mary Jo and I can't wait to see you. We're having a great time here. God bless you guys. Take care. Bye-bye. First of all, isn't it great to see Pastor Eric and Mary Jo? Right? And secondly, he was praying for revival six years ago, or five years ago, right? He called us to pray for revival. That call is reactivated again today, right? He's calling us as a church to revival, to pray for revival. Now, the marker's there. The church is not, obviously, right? That building was torn down in 1931. What happened in that building, friends, transformed the whole world. What happened in that building changed the entire world. What happened in that building is still impacting the world today. In fact, I got saved in the Assemblies of God denomination, right? I grew up in the AG, right? Woo -woo. The AG can trace our roots right back to Azusa Street, right? I am fruit, and so are you, of the Azusa Street mission. See that? What occurred there in 1906 is still impacting the world today. That is revival, my friends. That is fire that spreads and spreads, and the Holy Spirit breeds a life. That's revival we want to see. Amen? Amen? William Seymour was a great man of God. This was a great, humble man of God. He was an amazing prayer warrior, and he was the right man at the right time at the right place, and God called him there. William Seymour prayed, talking about prayer, our first common denominator, before he went to Los Angeles, he prayed five and a half hours a day for two and a half years. And when he got to Los Angeles, God said, you're not praying enough, William. He started to pray for eight hours a day for the next year and a half. You do the math over those some odd years, that's a lot of prayer, my friends. It's no wonder God poured out his spirit at Azusa Street. Prayer always precedes an amazing revival. William Seymour arrived in 1906. His first sermon that he preached was on Acts chapter 2, what you and I just read. That was his first sermon. Here's the key. William Seymour hadn't received the baptism in the Holy Spirit yet. He wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit, but that was his first sermon on Acts chapter 2. And on 1906, April 6th, William Seymour declared a 10-day fast. Amazing, isn't it? Ten days were not needed because on day three, Owen Lee was baptized with the Holy Spirit. Pastor Seymour was staying at Owen Lee's house. And after three days of fasting, Owen Lee didn't feel too well. So he asked Pastor Seymour to pray for him for his healing. And Pastor Seymour laid hands on him, and he was healed. And then Owen Lee says, you know what? Can you pray that I would receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance, right? Now, I just told you William Seymour doesn't have that gift yet. But he laid hands on Owen Lee, and Owen Lee received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. Now, let me pause in the Azusa Street story here for just a second. Because some of you are thinking, wait, wait, Jim, hold on. How can a guy who doesn't have the gift of the Holy Spirit pray for someone to receive the Holy Spirit and they receive it? Is anybody wondering that? Thank you. It's really, really simple, friends. William Seymour is not the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Right? Let me prove it to you. John chapter 7, verse 37. This is Jesus. It's in red letters. It's Jesus. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, from within him shall flow rivers of living water. Now, you're probably wondering, like John was, like, what is he talking about? So John took the amazing step to tell us exactly what he's talking about. So this is John in verse 39. But this spake he, Jesus, of the Spirit, 
We say that believed on him were to receive, but the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus is talking about what exactly happened on the day of Pentecost, right? Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, not William Seymour. William Seymour believed in it, but Jesus is the baptizer. To receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you've got to go to Jesus. You've got to chase the giver. It's good to chase the gift, but chase the giver, right? Chase Jesus. And then the gift will come. He is the baptizer. That's how that can occur. Mr. Lee was so excited about his experience that when he and Pastor Seymour got to church that night, a little church on Bonnie Bray Street, we'll get to Azusa in a second, there were about seven or eight people in the room. That was the size of their church when they first started, right? And William Seymour begins to tell this gathered crowd about their experience with Owen Lee receiving the baptism. And Owen Lee just can't take him. He's just too excited, right? So William Seymour starts in. Owen Lee just chimes right in. He says, i got to tell my story. And he begins to tell his story, and he begins to speak in tongues. And as he begins to speak in tongues, the Holy Spirit falls and fills the room, just like at the day of Pentecost. And everybody in the room was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit God gave the utterance. And they ran out of the room, out into the street, praising God in tongues, prophesying, just like at the day of Pentecost. One young lady who fell off the, the bench of the piano got back up, began playing the piano. A beautiful worship song, which is just amazing, except for the fact that she never played the piano before. <laughs> Had never played the piano before. So that little house on Bonnie Bray Street, as you can imagine, word got out. So the next three nights, the crowds gathered, and they kept growing. He had to move out to the, the porch to preach the word of God to people in the yard and in the street. And on the third day, the porch collapsed under the weight. So the cops told him, William, you, you, you got to find a bigger building, son. Right? you got to go to a bigger place, sir. Right? So they went to 312. Okay. They went to, three, <laughs> they went to 312 Azusa Street. Their first service was on April 14th. This was a rundown building. And when I look at this building, I see or I picture another rundown stable 2,000 years ago that also transformed the world. But in this little building, 40 by 60, the benches were 2 by 12, and the seating for about 30 to 40. It would not be enough. It would not be enough. So on April 14th, they began there. On April 18th, four days later, the LA Times ran a front page story on the crazy goings on at Azusa Street. Right? Their intention was to mock and criticize the move of God, but it only further to announce and trumpet the outpouring of God. Well, the enemy went for evil, God used for good. Amen? Amen. Amen. He always does that, does he not? The second floor of Azusa Street was a prayer room. Prayer again. Every service, every time there was a service downstairs, there was somebody upstairs praying, right? You will pray before revival, and you will pray during the revival. That's how it will be sustained, right? There was always somebody in the upper room praying during their services downstairs. In the summer of 1906, the services in that building were continuous day and night. They would start about 10 o'clock in the morning, and they would go to 2 or 3 the next night in the morning. Continuous. And they went on for about three years. Holiness preachers as they were called back in the day, holiness preachers, and missionaries from all over the world came to Azusa Street, and they would take the revival back with them. People from all over the nations came to Azusa Street, right? You heard my brother Bishop today talk about his, his burden to go to the nations, right? He has a call to preach to the nations. My brother, wouldn't it be amazing if God brought the nations here, right? Come on. If God brought the nations to Journey Church, I'm feeling it. I don't know if you are, but praise God. The Azusa Street Mission was the first fully integrated church in the country. Maybe that's why they saw a revival, right? Or perhaps, just perhaps, friends, the result of an outpouring is unity. Amen? We need an outpouring, don't we? Praise God. 
Witnesses say that anyone who attended Azusa Street for any period of time saw miracles. You saw healings, you saw miracles, you saw some amazing moves of God. In fact, they had a phrase at Azusa Street that they would say. Because they saw miracles, they, their faith was, it was strong, right? So if somebody needed a healing, they would ask them if you want healed. And then they would simply say, let's just pray and see what God will do. And boy, did God move. Boy, did he move. The wall in Azusa Street had wheelchairs and crutches and other medical devices that people came in with. But they didn't need it when they left. Amen? One gentleman had his arm severed in a work accident. And he happened to wander into Azusa Street. And he told what? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. That, that buzzing must just be me then. <laughs> the enemy is not going to stop it. Sorry. This is God's day. This is God's house. Amen? Amen. The gentleman walked in, arm severed. Told William Seymour he can't really work. This is his job. It was a job accident. William Seymour told the crowd, the man has got to work, right? He needs to make a living for his family. William Seymour laid hands on him. His arm was restored. And that wasn't the only limb at Azusa Street that was restored. I don't know about you, friend, but I want to see that type of miracle in the altar of journey. Amen? And if you can't believe for that, your faith is too small because your God is too big. Amen? Praise God. A fascinating feature at Azusa Street, the Rashi 2, uh, was the constant and abiding and visible presence of God. Azusa Street called it the Shekinah glory. The first was this mist that would hover about a foot above the ground. It was there constantly, the mist. And when the Holy Spirit was really moving, the mist would fill the entire building. Kind of like in Solomon's day, when the priests really began to worship in unity, the cloud of the Lord would fill the temple. The second feature was the flames of fire that would appear above the building. And on numerous occasions, passerby would call the fire department and say the building's on fire. Well, the fire department finally stopped responding, right? Because it wasn't on fire. It was the presence of God. The LA Times, again, which wanted to criticize the movement, actually published and wrote a story about the flames of fire on Azusa Street. They actually documented their burning bush moment. Can you believe that? They thought they were criticizing. They publicized the burning bush moment. The legacy of Azusa Street is that nearly every single Pentecostal denomination group today can trace their roots right back to Azusa Street over a hundred years ago. And during the Azusa Street revival, William Seymour prophesied that within 100 years, there will be another great outpouring of the Spirit of God. In addition to William Seymour, David Young Cho of South Korea prophesied in 1993 that on the panhandle of Florida, there will be another outpouring. And praise God, both of them men got it right. Because in 1995, on Father's Day, we see the Brownsville revival impact our world. You can take Brown, uh, Azusa Street down. And Brownsville is another example where all three characteristics were in play, right? There was prayer, there was a sudden event, and there was a continued outpouring. As I said, every notable revival in church history started in prayer. Brownsville was no exception. They began praying two years before 95. In 1993, they began praying for revival. Patrick, Pastor Kilpatrick continued to talk about and preach about revival. They dedicated their Sunday night services to prayer for revival. They prayed for revival. After the, after the revival started, intercessory prayer teams were created, just like at Azusa Street. During the prayer time on Father's Day, 1995, Steve Hill preached that morning, and after the service, they came up, and the Holy Spirit just fell on that place. People were healed. People were saved. People were filled with the Holy Spirit. Pastor Kilpatrick was out in the spirit. And he laid on the stage for three hours. This is not your Presbyterian church, folks. Pastor Kilpatrick laid on the stage for three hours under the spirit and the power and the presence of God. And he said he couldn't move. But he felt wonderful. He said he felt all the stress just leave his body. Right? Now, I've got to be honest with you. Pastor Kilpatrick was a critic of spiritual phenomena. Things like falling, weeping, 
laughing, shaking. Other things that are common in some revivals, he was a critic of that stuff, right? But when you're under the power of God for three hours, you listen to what the Holy Spirit says. And the Holy Spirit had told him, look, John, if you want revival, don't tell me how to do it. Don't tell me when to do it, and don't tell me where to do it. You're just going to have to get out of the way, John. And thank God Pastor Kilpatrick got out of the way. Amen? In all, over 200,000 people claim to have been saved through the Brownsville revival. 200,000 people. By 1998, more than 2.5 million people from all over the world came to the revival services Tuesday through Sunday. And Patrick Kilpatrick, Pastor Kilpatrick described it this way. He said, corporate businessmen in expensive suits, I get that picture. Again, I'm pictorial, so get that picture. Corporate businessmen in very expensive suits. Kneel and weep uncontrollably as they repent of their secret sins. And right beside them, drug addicts and prostitutes fall to the floor in their faces. Right beside them. To lie prostrate before God as they confess Jesus as Lord for the first time in their lives. Reserved elderly women and weary young mothers dance before the Lord. Unashamedly with joy. They have been forgiven. Young children see incredible visions of Jesus. Their face a picture of divine delight framed by slender arms raised to touch God. That revival touched every walk of life, every class, every age, every race. And by the fall of 2000, more than 1,000 people were attending their revival school. And Brownsville didn't just hoard the revival. They sent teams out to share the revival. And in 1997, they came to my church, my church in Pennsylvania. And our church saw incredible revival for months. Our Sunday night services went till after midnight. But I'll never forget the first night that they came. It was one of those Sunday night revival services. So I showed up expecting a Sunday night revival service. I didn't know who Brownsville was. And as I covered the crest of the hill to pull into the church, something was different. The parking lot was packed. I had to park in a dirt field that I didn't even know existed. I walk into church, and I see a bunch of people I don't even recognize. For a second, I thought I was in the wrong church. And I walked into sanctuary. It was, we had a big sanctuary about this size. Walked into sanctuary, place was packed. Every seat was taken, standing room only along the wall, right? And somebody's in my seat. <laughs> and I thought, all right, I'll get it tomorrow night, because tomorrow night's Monday. And only the super spiritual people go on Monday night, right? <laughs> but I found an opening just to my left where I could squeeze in between a, between a gentleman and a couple. And as I squeezed in and said hello, the pastor came out and kind of introduced the Brownsville team and prayed over the service. And then the Brownsville team began to, to uh, worship. And by the third beat, the power of God hit the woman right beside me. And she buckled, her knees went down, and she leaned into me. And I'm like, I need to touch her, right? I need some of that. But she said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And her husband said, I'm, I'm sorry, buddy, I'm sorry. And her husband grabbed his wife, and he ushered her out of the sanctuary. She walked away from the presence of God. She walked away from the power of God. My friends never walk away from the presence of God. And husbands, never take your wife away from the presence of God. And never prevent her from being in the presence of God. Amen? I believe as a church, I believe God is calling us to that, that moment. Let me show you the same mistake that Israel made. Israel same, made that same mistake as that gentleman made in Exodus chapter 20. Moses had been going up to the mountain. And God told Moses, I want to speak to the people. Tell them to prepare for three days and then tell them to come to the foot of the mountain and I want to spend time with my people. Up until now, Moses was the only one who spent time with God. But God the Father wanted to spend time with his children. They had the opportunity to be in the manifest presence of God. And you know what they said. Here's what they said. And they said unto Moses, they Israel, you speak to us 
and we will hear you. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before you that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick cloud. I fundamentally believe that if the nation of Israel had said yes to Jesus, yes to the God the Father that day, and not stood him up at the altar, they would not have wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. I believe that. I believe God has been preparing us as a church for months. And I believe he's calling us into his presence. And I pray that we don't make the same mistake that Israel made. Amen? I've got just a few minutes, I know. And as I was preparing this, the Lord reminded me of a vision or prophecy he gave me a couple years ago. And it was just after, it was actually doing, or just after a freedom conference. Any freedom folks in here? <laughs> oh, yeah. Love freedom. So it was three or four years ago, the Freedom Conference was in here. It was amazing. The Holy Spirit moved. People were baptized with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. And I could just feel, you know how you can feel the Holy Spirit. You can feel God's presence, right? That Sunday morning worship was amazing. That weekend was amazing. And I was just praising God. And I could feel it every time I thought about it all week. And then Monday morning, I'm in my office, and I work out of my house. So it's, my office is right beside my front door. And it begins to rain outside, and I just, I'm thanking God for the outpouring of his spirit. And I walked out my front door, and I just stood there, and it's drizzling, and I'm just thanking him for pouring out his Holy Spirit. And as I said that, it began to rain heavier. And I hear the Holy Spirit say, there's more. There is more of my spirit. And then I'm getting the chills again, and I'm just praising him and thanking him. And a car drives by. And obviously, they're not being touched by the rain, right? They're enclosed in a car. And I hear the Holy Spirit say, but there will be some who don't even know what's happening. I will pour out my spirit, and some won't even understand what I'm doing. And then another car goes by, and he says, and there will be some who will reject my outpouring. Now, I'm happy to report to you, both of those cars were small and compact. So the Spirit was saying, that's the minority. But the majority will step in, will lean in, will press in, will come to the base of the mountain. And that's where we are, Journey. That's where we are. He's calling us to the base of the mountain. Amen? Okay, i got to wrap this up. You still with me? Here's the application. Will you stand with me? Here's the application for you and me. We have to pray for revival, right? I'm happy to tell you that every Sunday morning, right back here at 9 o'clock, there's a team of folks that gather and pray for revival. Every Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, there's a group that comes in here to pray for revival. You are invited to both of those services. Amen? We have to fast, and we are fasting now. Fasting has to be in our DNA. The third thing we have to do, we have to prepare for a suddenly moment. How do you prepare for a suddenly moment? We realize when he pours out his spirit, it's him and not us, and we get out of the way. We clear the stage, right? It's his service, it's his house, it's his outpouring, and we get out of the way, right? We have a prayer team here at Journey, but can I tell you, Journey, you are the prayer team. When it comes to revival, you are the prayer team. And this is how we're going to end today. If you want revival, I'm going to invite you to just come to the altar. Find a place up here and pray. If you want revival, find a place up here to pray. And I'm going to walk off the stage and give the service to the Lord. It's his. I'm going to get out here and pray. It's his service. If you need healing in here, find somebody up here. Doesn't have to be a prayer team member. Just ask them to lay hands on you and pray, and let's see what God will do. If you need salvation today, come here, find somebody, say, I need Jesus. Amen? The service will end when the Holy Spirit releases you. We're not going to close the service. The second group may come in, that's okay. When the Holy Spirit releases you, from praying for revival, then you may leave. But be quiet because others may still be praying, okay? If you want to be part of the revival prayer team, I invite you to come and pray now.